All this month we've been talking about things that God loves. And so just to kind of recap where we've been so far this month, we've seen that God loves His people. Amen? Those who humble themselves before Him, those who He calls His children, and because God has a heart for them, we too need to have a heart for God's people. There is this, there is to be this special kind of love relationship that we share with one another as Christians. And we're even told that the world will know that we are followers of Jesus by the way we love one another. We saw last week that God has a heart for, that God loves righteousness. He is a God who always does the right thing. Amen? He loves that, and he loves it when we do the right thing. Yes, there is grace for us when we mess up, but what is the expectation for those who follow Jesus? We need to be what kind of people? We need to be righteous people. Today, what we're going to talk about is uh, as we're talking about God's love, we're going to see actually what is a very complicated love relationship. And the one verse where we see this played out a lot and it is probably the most quoted verse of the New Testament, right? The, the most quoted verse of all time from the New Testament. It is John 3.16. Now, I just said that reference, and what happened in a lot of your heads? You just already started quoting it, didn't you? I say John 3.16 in your head, you already kind of know it. I say the reference and it just pops in there. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We all know that verse. And I want you to notice something there. In that verse, what does God love? In that verse, what does God love? Well, let's not get confused because there are verses that tell us, do not love the world or anything in the world. And what that's talking about is just very simply our priorities. Do not prioritize the world over, over God. But you look at what God loves and what does God love? It says God loves the world. And, and the word here in, in the original language is, is the word where we get the word cosmos. Anybody hear the word cosmos? Remember back in the day there was a TV show called that that was, that was on, on TV, right? And that word cosmos very simply means all of creation. The word cosmos means everything. It means everything that was created. So God loves what? Everything he created. God loves it. You go back to the book of Genesis and we see it, right? We see it as he, as he does the work of creation, as he, as he brings things into existence. We see when he made it, he said, you know, let there be light. And what was there? And, and it was what? That means God loves the light. And then he made the atmosphere and the heavens, and God looked at it and said it was what? And that means that God loves the heavens. And then he made the dry ground and he separated the waters and he looked at that. And what is it? Don't stop on me now. What is it? Ah, uh, there we go. God loves the land and the sea. And then he made all the vegetation all over the earth, and he looked at it, and it was what? God loves those plants. And he made the sun and the moon and the stars, and they were all. And God loves all of those heavenly bodies. And he made the fish, and he made the birds, and they were all. And God loves them. 
And then he made all the living things that live on the dry ground. That means he made the cows and the horses and the lizards and the dogs. We're still uncertain where cats came from, but <clears throat> and so many more animals. And all of the ones the Lord made are what? Good. Good. <laughs> Except for cats. <clears throat> And God loves all of that. And then you read in Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 31. <clears throat> then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the living things that move on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have it for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was. Ah, some of you caught, caught that. It's not good. What is it? It's very good. God so loves the world. And he made us. He made human beings. What did he make us to be? He made us to be image bearers of God himself. He made us to be stewards of this whole creation. We are here to exercise dominion over the creation. And then something happens. <laughs> what happens? Yeah. See, like there's, if you look at the original flow kind of, I like to think of it as a flow of authority, right? The original flow of authority goes God, human beings, creation. And we're here to represent God to the rest of the cosmos. That's what human beings were created for, to represent God to the rest of the creation. And God looked at that and said, not just it's good, God says creation is very good. And then there came a day that changed everything. It changed everything, not for the better, it changed everything for the worse. Because something else was included in that flow of authority. One day, those very first human beings, they decided to not trust God. They decided to not trust his authority. Rather, they, they wanted to listen to another voice, right? They decided that this other way is actually what they wanted to do. They wanted to decide for themselves what right and wrong is. <laughs> they wanted to, to do with the world what they wanted to do with the world. And they looked at God, and, and maybe in their minds, it's, you know, God's, God's actually kind of holding us back. <laughs> God's holding us back. We could, we could do so much more here. 
And so we read there in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God, but, uh, but God said, You shall not eat of the, true, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden or the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, um, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, what's the serpent who deceived me? And I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat in the day, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten to, of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man... And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What do we see 
in this account. We see the worst day in human history. The crowning jewel of God's creation, the image bearers of God who were meant to exercise dominion over the creation on God's behalf, yet what did they do? They allowed another authority in that flow of authority. In the original language, and in the original language, the word for him there is the nakash. Okay? That word can be rendered serpent. Depends on how you use the word. The word can be rendered serpent. The word also can be rendered deceiver. It also can be rendered sorcerer. And when we see things as like this flow of authority, as goes humanity, so goes what? You pick it up on that? As goes humanity, so goes the cosmos. The creation. When humanity fell, the creation is cursed. The thing that God loved, the people that God loved were corrupted by the serpent and by sin. And he couldn't just let the rebellion continue. He couldn't just let us go on in that state. God had to do something about it. And this is why we die. See, this is when death enters the world. Just as sin entered the world, this is Romans 5.12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. We talked about this before. How many sinners do we have in the room? And so we couldn't go on living forever in rebellion against God. So death became a part of the human experience. But this is not what human beings were designed for. This is not what creation was made for. And so we get to verses like John 3.16. And if you keep reading that, here's what that says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Anybody know 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. God loves the creation so much that he couldn't just leave it cursed. And so this is a very often overlooked part of the redemptive work of Jesus. Yes, Jesus came to save humanity, but also to bring all creation back under the ultimate headship of God the Father. And when the image of God is restored within people, that's what happens when you become a Christian. The image of God is restored within you. When the image of God is restored within people, we are to continue the work of subduing the world. But that is in preparing it to be made new. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, 18 through 25. He said, so I, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation, for the cosmos, right? The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it 
and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What does Paul say there? He says, there's a day coming, right? Think about that worst day in human history. There's, a, there's an amazing day in human history coming, right? When we will be made what? New. And we have that hope now. We have that promise now. We have the Holy Spirit who is the first fruit of that now. But there is actually a day coming. There is literally a day coming when we will be revealed as the sons of God. And creation is waiting for that. When humanity is made new, what else is going to be made new? As goes humanity, so goes the creation. When humanity is made new, the creation is going to be made new. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So for us now as people, hopefully we gather together this morning as people who care about what God loves. Everybody care about what God loves? Anybody want to love what God loves? So we need to see this world. Yeah, we need to not love the world or anything in the world, meaning we do not, we do not put it above God in our priority list. <laughs> but we need to love the world the way that God loves the world. We need to see the world as something that needs to be redeemed. How many, things, how many of you think the world needs to be redeemed? We need to see the world as something that needs to be redeemed, something that needs to be restored Something that needs to be reconciled back to God. Anybody believe that about the world? So it's easy for us to look out and to see things that are wrong with the world. Because what do we witness? Sometimes we witness our culture that is in decline. Sometimes we look out at the world and we see sin being normalized. We see things that are evil that are called good and now good is being called evil. Right? Anybody see that? And we need to remember that's a part of the what? That's a part of the curse, right? But when we let Jesus, listen to this, Christian. When you let Jesus restore the image of God within you, who do you become? You need to become a person who is fighting against the curse, right? Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, it goes on to say, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth 
comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now you read that and, and uh, you know, what I've debated with people over these verses forever that belief is not the only requirement for salvation here. Um, in literature, it's called a, a synecdoche or something like that. Is that what that's called? Um, which is just, you know, it's like, it's like another example of um, when you wanted, back in the day when you wanted to get married to a woman, you ask for her hand in marriage, right? Is that all you're expecting is her hand? No, like it's a synecdoche too. So one part stands for the whole, right? And so belief is the same kind of way. It stands for the whole process of salvation. But the point here in this verse is, <clears throat> do you believe Jesus? And when I say, do you believe Jesus, the question is, do you believe Jesus? Are you going to trust him for your salvation? It means more than just be belief because it says, um, if you believe, then you'll start living by the truth, right? And this is a part of what Christian people are to be doing. We're to bring things into the light. We're supposed to be people who are reconciling and redeeming and renewing and restoring. Why? Because the image of God has been restored within us. Everybody get that? Several years ago, this is kind of an extreme example, but like several years ago, I, was, I went to this conference and um, I was speaking to a guy there who was planting a brand new church in Seattle. And we were having this conversation, and um, they had purchased a building that they were going to start meeting in, downtown Seattle. <clears throat> and um, the reason why this stood out to me is the choice of their building was very interesting. Um, they had bought an old strip club in downtown Seattle. And uh, he said, you know, the first week that we meet we're going to leave the stage set up. And you're like, what? Yeah, we're going to leave the stage set up in that strip club. We're going to leave the poles up. There's poles on the stage. And there's a few cages, actually, that are hanging there that at one time naked women had danced in. And uh, he said that they decided to buy that particular location and they're going to have their first meeting there like that because of what it represents. It represents redemption. It stood for taking something that was lost. Taking something that was dedicated to sin and turning it around and making it something beautiful. Something that could be dedicated to the glory of God. And that, extent, that example has always stood out to me because I've seen a lot of examples of the opposite. Anybody ever seen examples of the opposite? Like, one example is, you, you look at the state of all of our colleges in this country, and, and many of them were started as what? Anybody know? <laughs> Actually, a lot of higher Christian education in this country were started as seminaries. Started as places where you sent to train preachers to go in into the ministry. And, and now what is the state of a lot of our colleges in this country? So we've seen these things moving the other direction, right? We've seen things that were created to be godly become godless. Think of the number. I, I was thinking about this week, the number of talented musicians who were out there, and a lot of them, where did they get their start? Yeah, in the church. And then they become popular, and what happens? Right? So we see it moving in the other direction, and, and that's what the cursed world does. But the church, Christians, people who love what God loves, we're supposed to be moving things in the other direction. We are supposed to be 
helping people to be redeemed, to be restored, to be rescued, to be revived. We're supposed to share God's heart for redeeming the world. And then one day, one day, guess what's actually going to happen? One day, he is actually, literally going to show up and he will renew everything. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning. If you want to be redeemed, if you want to be restored, everybody stand up. If you want to be renewed, if you want to be reconciled back to God, we're going to sing a song of decision this morning. You come forward being a person of faith, being willing to change, willing to repent, being jo uh, to be joined with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. We saw a video of that earlier. And uh, then you rise up as somebody who the image of God has been restored within you, and you need to be a reconciler, a redeemer, a renewer. Let's go ahead and sing the song. If you want to make a decision, you come forward today.